basically what that means is if you are a grower or a processor, most of your costs are associated with growing and processing that product so that you can then go and sell it. So you can deduct most of your expenses as a cost of goods sold. But if you are a dispensary, a retail location, your cost of goods sold are basically the costs to purchase the product. You're not going to be able to write off uh, what you're paying your employees. You're not going to be able to write off a large portion of your rent. Probably not going to be able to write off your utilities. You're not going to be able to write off other expenses associated with your business. So there are a lot of dispensaries that are paying effective tax rates of 75, 80, 85 percent um, on their gross income. And that can be a real bummer uh, because if you know, you're earning $300,000 and you have expenses of $200,000 and um, you don't get to deduct that $200,000 when you're paying your taxes. So uh, it's not, I, I think the answer is yes. We have not yet dealt with that issue because nobody's earning revenue uh, here in Ohio yet. But uh, my general sense is that, yeah, uh, under state law, they will be able to, de to deduct their state um, on their state returns. But it still is going to be you know, a huge issue when they're, when they're filing their federal returns. Um, and so one of the things to consider when you're working with cannabis companies is, you know, the typical business advice for a new company is form an LLC. It's flexible. It's easy. It's passed through taxation. You don't want to be a C-corp, right? You're going to get double taxed on that income. You get taxed at the corporate level and then you get taxed as a shareholder. But if you're a company that's, that has an 80% effective tax rate, you're going to pass through your profits to the shareholders or the individual owners, but you're also going to pass through tax deficiency liability. So if you are a pass-through entity and that entity owes more, owes more in taxes than it, than it has the ability to pay, your owners are going to be personally on the hook uh, for that tax deficiency. So we always advise, at least at the dispensary level, you actually do want to be a C-Corp because you can inoculate the shareholders and the owners by keeping that tax liability at the corporate level. And if you can't pay it and you have to shut the company down, you have a better chance of being able to protect uh, the shareholders in the business. And it's also really important for this purpose to track all of your expenses as a cannabis company so that you can be absolutely sure what expense is a cost of goods sold versus what expense is just a typical business expense that you're not going to be able to write off. Um, banking access, as I mentioned, is super limited. Um, there was some guidance issued by the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network by FinCEN that provided a roadmap to financial institutions as to how to bank this industry. The problem is that their guidance imposed a lot of extra obligations on a financial institution in order to serve this market in a compliant manner. Uh, when they're doing their due diligence and as they're monitoring cannabis accounts, they need to know what revenue does this account holder expect while it's banking with me? What's the revenue expected from its competitors? What's the revenue generally in the community? How much are these companies bringing in? What is this company disclosing as revenue on its tax returns? And does that match up with what we're seeing in the particular account? How often should these companies be making deposits? How often should they be making withdrawals? Who should they be paying and how often should they be paying them? Um, are they compliant with state regulations? It's a lot of work for a bank to verify that for a single account and then have to do that repeatedly if they're taking on multiple cannabis account holders. So for that reason, most banks have just said, uh, the lemon is not worth the squeeze. Um, and because of that, under Ohio's medical marijuana law, the regulators have the option to set up what's called a closed loop payment system. And essentially, the way that this would work is you'd, you'd have sort of like a debit card. And you would enroll all of your vendors in this closed loop payment system. And the state would process all of these transactions uh, inside that, that system. Um, unfortunately, at some point, you're going to have to pay somebody outside that system. And then that vendor that you're paying, whether it's your landlord, whether it's a, a utility company, whether it's you know, your cell phone bill or whomever you're getting services from, is going to know that check is coming from a state 
closed loop payment system and there's really only one reason you would have a closed loop payment system, it's because this is a, a check that's coming from proceeds of federally illegal drug trafficking. So I don't think it necessarily solves the problem. There is one bank, there's a credit union down in the Dayton area that has indicated an interest in servicing this industry. So we're hopeful that uh, in Ohio there will be some access to banking um, for cannabis companies. Uh, and I also want to mention, it's something that people sort of forget about. Um, there's this uh, Form 8300 that needs to get filled out and submitted as a uh, currency transaction report any time uh, you're taking cash or you're uh, giving cash uh, in excess of $10,000. This is not a marijuana-specific uh, rule. It's been a rule for a very long time. Uh, and this impacts us as lawyers, uh, especially if we are taking retainers from people in our law firm and it's a $10,000 or more cash retainer. Um, lawyers still do and law firms still do need to file that Form 8300. Now the disclosures we make on that form can be different because we have certain confidentiality concerns with our clients, but keep in mind uh, if you have a cannabis client that is paying you 15 grand in cash because they don't have a bank, um, you need to figure out whether or not you need to file that Form 8300. Um, I want to talk now about real hemp and CBD oil. Uh, you folks may have seen that CBD oil has been in the news lately. There is so much bad information out there about industrial hemp and CBD oil. Um, and, and some of it is caused by just confusion about the law. Some of it is caused by differing interpretations of the law and cannabis industry is certainly uh, one industry where you could have five lawyers up on stage, ask them a question about marijuana and you'll get 10 different answers from five lawyers. So, uh, but I do want to give sort of my general thought on industrial hemp and CBD. And where I want to start is, again, brief background, the cannabis plant has dozens of different cannabinoids. The two biggest ones are THC and CBD. Uh, both have medicinal properties. The biggest difference though is that THC is the, the cannabinoid that gets you high. CBD has no intoxicating effect like THC might. Um, marijuana has a very specific definition under both federal law and under state law. And there are parts of the marijuana plant that are not classified, or there are parts of the cannabis plant that are not necessarily classified as marijuana. Um, those are essentially the mature stalk of the plant and the sterilized seeds of the plant. And so here's a... Uh, I'm sorry. So there's no, there's no federal research, no federally funded research on marijuana such that it would support like a, um, a peer reviewed study to remove cannabis from schedule one to schedule two or three or four or to, to remove it from the schedules altogether. Um, there is research that it is conducted on cannabis, it's just not federally funded research. So there's a lot less research than we would like because most research that's done on, on drugs and, uh, um, and medical products is done with some type of federal funding. Um, so this is the definition of marijuana under the Controlled Substances Act and you can see I've highlighted in red the um, exempted parts of the plant uh, that are not controlled substances. And the important thing, and this, the definition of marijuana is a total mess under both federal law and state law. And the reason is you, you start out with marijuana is all parts of the cannabis plant except mature stalks, um, fiber from the stalks, and sterilized seeds, except that the resin on mature stalks, et cetera, is still a controlled substance. And uh, if you've ever seen a cannabis plant, the resin is that sticky, kind of shiny stuff that's on the plant. Um, that's the resin. So you can have a mature stalk that has a whole bunch of resin on it. And the resin, uh, 
uh, according to a lot of scientific liter literature, is really the stuff that has those cannabinoids. That's, that's where the good stuff is uh, if you want to extract things from the cannabis plant. And so you can see how there's uh, the definition of marijuana, an exception, and then an exception to the exception under federal law. And under Ohio law, it's basically the same thing, the difference being that except the resin extracted is separated by commas uh, instead of uh, parentheses. Yeah. Well, I think they're I think they're wrong uh, in, in how they're weighing the plant. Um, that's a good question. I mean, I I would argue that it does not. Um, that there are parts of the plant that are not controlled substances. Um, uh, I'd have to look at the case. Uh, I guess to to give you a better answer than than that, but I'd, I'd be happy to. <clears throat> and so th this definition of marijuana and the exceptions to the exceptions is really important when you're talking about CBD oil. Um, everybody and their brother nowadays, it seems like, is selling CBD oil. It's It's available online. It's probably still available in some health food stores here in Ohio. Um, CBD is a really interesting... Um, substance because its legality depends in large part on which part of the plant it's derived from. So we call that the source rule. Um, because not all parts of the plant are controlled substances, it necessarily follows that if you have, if you derive a substance from a part of the plant that's not illegal, that derivative should also not be illegal. And the example is if you derive CBD isolate from the bud of the plant. It is clearly within the definition of marijuana. That CBD from the bud and the resin on the bud is illegal. But if you can derive CBD from the mature stalk, you've got a really good argument that that CBD is legal because it's derived from a part of the plant that is not a controlled substance. Fortunately, there's a lot of scientific literature that's out there and there's a big debate going on right now as to whether or not you can actually get CBD from the parts of the plant that are exempt from the definition of marijuana. There's a lot of scientific literature that says if you have a mature stalk and you're getting CBD from it, you're really getting it from the resin that's on that stalk. And the resin is the exception to the exception. So the stalk itself isn't illegal, but the resin on the stalk um, is within the definition of marijuana. And then even once you get past that hurdle, let's say that you have CBD that you get from the mature stalk from a part of the plant that's not a controlled substance, the next question is, what do you do with it? Can you sell it to people and how do you sell it to people? Most CBD oil is now marketed as a dietary supplement, which is a certain class of products under FDA rules. But the FDA has been very clear that CBD is not a product that can be sold as a dietary supplement under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And the reason is uh, the FDA just recently approved an epilepsy drug called Epidiolex. And Epidiolex is based on CBD. And Epidiolex itself, the particular formation, was moved from Schedule 1 to Schedule 5, but CBD and all other cannabinoids of the cannabis plant remain in Schedule 1. And under FDA rules, if you have a drug that has been approved by the FDA, you can't market a dietary supplement that has as its active ingredient the same stuff that's, that's the active ingredient in the uh, approved drug. So the FDA said, because we have Epidiolex as an approved drug, you can't market uh, CBD dietary supplements. To date, they have not taken really any enforcement action other than sending cease and desist letters uh, to companies that are making health claims uh, for CBD oil, these companies that are out there that say, take CBD, it'll cure your cancer. Um, you can throw away all your medications if you take CBD oil. It'll help with your particular conditions. 
those types of claims are in violation of just general dietary supplement rules uh, under FDA rules, and so they've sent cease and desist letters uh, to those companies. The area gets more complicated when you think about uh, federal action that's been taken to legalize, in some part, industrial hemp. And so in 2014, there was language added to the 2014 Farm Bill that uh, defined industrial hemp as cannabis plant that has less than 0.3% THC. And what Farm Bill said is a state can set up a research pilot program uh, to study industrial hemp. And those states said, great, we want to study the commercial viability of industrial hemp. And to do that, we are going to allow our uh, pilot program participants to grow, process, and sell industrial hemp. And the DEA quickly took the position that, uh, well, you can't do that, and you certainly can't sell industrial hemp products into a state that does not have an industrial hemp program. So for example, Kentucky industrial hemp pilot program participants are not permitted to sell hemp derived CBD oil into Ohio because Ohio doesn't yet have an industrial hemp program. So then what Congress did in 2016 was uh, they basically did for industrial hemp what Dave Joyce's amendment did for medical marijuana. And they said you can't use federal funds to stop people from selling industrial hemp derived products in, you know, uh, within a state or outside of a state that has an industrial hemp program. 